And uh, Brother Tom, it's been a blessing to consider this subject with you, and we're, I'm looking forward to our uh, discussion. <laughs> so, Likewise. While the phrase in the world, but not of it, is not an exact scriptural quotation, the principle was explicitly stated by our Lord Jesus at the end of his earthly ministry. Brother Tom, can you tell us where we can find that and perhaps read it for us, please? Okay, the uh, passage is found in the 17th chapter of John, verses 16, 17, and 18. We're going to read starting in 13 and read through 19. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by thy tr the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Brother Tom and I thought that uh, we would consider this concept of being in the world but not of it in three parts. The first part would be the fact that we are sent into the world. Part two <clears throat> is, but we're not of the world. And then three, uh, that's the to-do section. How are we to stay separate from the world? So Brother Tom, why are we sent into the world or left in the world to live our lives? You know, that's in contrast to the monks who sought to isolate themselves from the world in their abbeys and on top of mountains in order to, you know, practice, or, you know, practice holiness that way or develop holiness. Well, probably none of the points that we bring out today will be any surprise to you, but we hope that by going through them, it will be helpful in uh, in having good guidelines for ourselves as we are in the world and so one of the reasons uh, we are living in the world is because it develops helps us develop christ-like character many of the christian characteristics faith self-control perseverance brotherly kindness agape love can best be developed in our trials in our difficult experiences found in our interaction with the world around us. And one of the scriptures that uh, immediately comes to mind is James 1, and we're going to read verses 2 to 4 and verse 12. Consider it pure joy, my brethren, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Brother Tom, this reminds me of what Paul says in Romans, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse three. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, and that can be really difficult to do, because we know that <clears throat> suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character so here paul especially mentions character coming from these experiences and character hope or expectation and the hope does not disappoint us because god has poured out his love into our hearts by the holy spirit which he has given to us you know paul adds in romans 12 too he says do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world so so now we have this contrast being established we're no longer conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renovation or the renewing of your mind, so that you may be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Yeah, that's a very important scripture, one that was in Brother David's uh, discourse this morning, being transformed. And one of the images in the scriptures of being transformed and and uh, developing this character is is the Im the imagery of bearing fruit uh christian fruit so beautifully demonstrated by christ because it'll be our responsibility in the kingdom 
to help the world bear the same kind of fruit in the development of their character and thereby gain everlasting life. Exactly. And, and Jesus spent a lot of time in the 15th chapter of John really talking about this development of the truth and sort of the, the fruit and the ramifications of that. Beginning with John 15, 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, God takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. You know, prunes means cutting, cutting off extraneous growth so that it will be, bear more fruit. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. So that's the key. We have to bear in, we have to abide in Christ to bear this fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. You know, as I was looking up that scripture, uh, I appreciated a, a note, a comment by, from Barnes Notes on this passage. And, and he wrote, to bear fruit is to show by our lives that we are under the influence of the religion of Christ and that that religion pr produces in us its appropriate effects. I like that. Now, a second reason we might consider why living uh, of, uh, that we are living in this world be is because it enables us to share in the human experience, to develop love for them, including our enemies, and to develop sympathy for the experiences and infirmities that our, that our fellow humans are going through. Our love, Lord lived among humanity for 33 and a half years. He knew their aspirations for a satisfying life. He saw their struggles and their disappointments when those aspirations were not fulfilled. He knew those of noble character and those whose brutality and greed destroyed the lives of others. He experienced the sorrow of lives cut short in death, and he was motivated by love for them to sacrifice his life to bring humanity a renewed opportunity for a satisfying, righteous, and endless life. And he wants and needs us to experience the same thing. That's why we are in the world. And one of the uh, scriptures that brings that out, uh, talking about our Lord, is Hebrews 4.15 which says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was, is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, and we should be able to sympathize with the weaknesses and failings of the world around us. I remember Brother Carl once saying that, you know, Jesus was tempted tested in, in experiences like we, the church, but we are tested and given the experiences of the world around us. You know, Jesus talked about developing this love of humanity in Matthew, the fifth chapter, in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with verse 43. And he says the change that came upon Christians from, from, the, Jewish, from the Jewish world. Beginning with verse 43, he says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute. So Jesus is now changing the rules. He's saying, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? <laughs> and if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, you know, it brought the thought to mind. We cannot learn to love our enemies unless two things happen. One, we have enemies. And two, we have interaction with them. And we're sent in the world to accomplish both of those things. Yeah, we must develop a, a love that transcends the human differences that we have. We're all different from one another. And um, we, we have to transcend those human differences and identities. The parable of the Good Samaritan, Brother Ernie, was a good lesson on this point. The Samaritan was able to bridge that gap between 
the Jewish people and his own identity as a Samaritan, you know, and um, because the Jews, <clears throat> he recognized the humanity of the injured man. Uh, he didn't let a cultural or ethnic difference reduce his duty of love and care toward the man. And this is a powerful and pertinent message for us today. Jesus, with the other examples, he said he was not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But he did not hesitate to reach out and act graciously and lovingly toward those who were not Jews. He spoke kindly to the Samaritan woman at the well in Sychar and offered living water of eternal life to her. And he healed the servant of a Roman centurion. I like a, a quote that, that my sister shared with me uh, from a man by the name of Paul Farmer, who was an American physician and co-founder of Partners in Health uh, that brings medical care to some of the poorest people in the world. And this is what he said from all of his experiences of dealing with all different people around the world. He said, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. We cannot look at others and say their lives matter less. That's exactly true. Their lives matter, do not matter less to God. Or to Jesus. Correct. You know, the Apostle Paul spoke about how Jesus shared man's humanity in Hebrews, the second chapter, beginning in verse 14. He said, since the children have flesh and blood, he shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And then jumping down to verse 17, he adds, For this reason he, or Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered, he was tempted. Excuse me, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those being tempted. And since we desire to be part of this merciful priesthood to bless all the families of the earth in Christ's kingdom, we need to go through those same experiences so that we can be merciful and empathetic as well. Definitely. And because our Lord shared in the humanity of those to whom he ministered, it drew him to become more emotionally invested in their welfare and eventual <laughs> restoration. You know, we, he wept at Lazarus's tomb and he's invested in their res the rescue of humanity from sin and death, their restoration to a harmonious relationship with his father. He had been his father's active agent in creating this human race. Living among them surely deepened his desire to rescue and restore them. A third reason I think why we're sent into the world is to test our loyalty and obedience to the Heavenly Father. Uh, similar way our Lord's loyalty and obedience was tested. You know, Paul writes about Jesus testing in Hebrews the fifth chapter, verses eight through 10. And I particularly like the, the Phillips translation. Hebrews 5, eight, but son though he was, he had to prove the meaning of obedience through all that he suffered. Then when he had been proved the perfect son, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who should obey him, being now recognized by God himself as high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You know, Jesus said that this hatred that he experienced and which tested his loyalty to the Father would be experienced by his disciples in John the 17th chapter in the same prayer that he made uh, from which our, title, our subject is taken. Beginning with verse 14 of John 17, I have given them your word, and he's speaking of his disciples and really of us, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You know, we're hated by the world and the adversary. They will make every effort to derail or destroy us because we stand in contrast to them. And that condemns them. And so we need to be prepared for this and to succeed in demonstrating our loyalty to God no matter what experience we face. Remember what, what we're told in Revelation 2.10? Be thou faithful 
and the NIV says, to the point of death, mm -hmm. and I will give you a crown of life. You know, we need to be prepared to suffer because, you know, it can come on us extremely suddenly, you know, without warning. And Janice and I faced an experience just like this in India in 2005. Mm. It, it was a big surprise. Wow. <laughs> you know, um, we are faced with all kinds of trials and testings. And one of the very comforting promises uh, that we have from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, is verse 13. Uh, the New American Standard uh, reads this way, no temptation or no experience has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. I, I do like today's English version on that last phrase. He says, every test that comes to you is the kind that normally comes to people. So we, we get the same things that other people uh, experience. That's by God's design. But it goes on to say, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. Uh, Janice and I have a sign in our home that we bought once when we were on a trip that we saw in a store that says, I know God won't give me anything I can't handle, I just wish he didn't trust me so much. <laughs> we appreciate that. And we're going to take off on this. The interesting part is that the next verse, after talking about our testing and God being able to help us through and uh, to endure it, the next verse says, therefore, my beloved, free I flee from idolatry. Wow, that, that seems like a real big change. But if you look at the context of before these verses where it's talking about the experiences of Israel in their 40 years in the wilderness, the summation of their errors was idolatry. And, and, and uh, Paul there links this uh, by verse 14. <clears throat> we think of many things in this world becoming idols, money, material possessions, power, fame, notoriety, we can do that even within our fellowship, such as being noted for being very wise or knowledgeable. But the most subtle and easy idol is self. And that was the idol that Israel was guilty of. They were serving their own self-will, their own desires, their preferences. Oh, we're tired of this manna. Give us some meat to eat. <clears throat> that was their idolatry during the exodus from Egypt, as Paul explained. The me first mentality or attitude, it's the most subtle temptation that we can face, and it's the most destructive to the new creature that has been begun in us. So that's why Paul links this talking about help, God helping us through trials and then pointing out the most subtle one is idolatry of self-will. Ah, another reason, Brother Ernie, um, living in this world, we are to be Christ's ambassadors, proclaiming the gospel, inviting people to be reconciled to God and to become consecrated followers of Jesus. One of my favorite passages in the Bible, because it kind of kind of gives an overview in a certain way of God's whole plan, is 2 Corinthians 5, uh, the passage about reconciliation. I'd like to read verses 14 to 15 and 18 to 21. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. For God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our work is the message of reconciliation.
You know, Jesus talked about this ministry of reconciliation. He didn't put it in those terms. He called it the gospel of the kingdom. But he mentioned in Matthew 24, 14, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end would come. But his final words to his disciples as he was ascending to heaven, he, he added this and made this responsibility personal. Acts 1.8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that, that responsibility didn't end with the 12 or whoever was in that. It, it's passed down to all of us. We have the responsibility to be the witnesses of our Lord. And one of the outstanding examples was the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, he talks about the importance of this. He says, yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust that was committed to me. In the words that you just read. And 1 Peter 3.15 uh, says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. We need to sanctify, make holy Christ in our hearts continually so that we are always ready to make a defense, give a reason for the hope that is in us, and share that gospel message our lives should display holiness, not holier than thou, but holiness that reflects our Lord Jesus as we preach his message of the kingdom. You know, part of our witnessing is to be lights in this dark world. And we've had a number of references to that, to that from the platform this week. Yeah. You know, Jesus said he was the light of the world while he was in it, and he called us to be lights in the world as well you know he said in john 8 12 he said i am the light of the world whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life and i think his brother david said this morning in the baptismal discourse follow me that was one of the three characteristics of being a disciple a follower of jesus is follow him and that's how we have the light of life but then he goes on and says this transfer this responsibility is now transferred to us uh, Matthew 5 14 through 16 he says you are the light of the world people don't light a lamp and then hold it under a bowl instead they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way he says let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your father in heaven yeah, and Ernie, the, the, uh, the light that we want to uh, uh, have radiating from us is, is not merely the message of the kingdom, but also the influence which emanates from our lives as we live in this world. It is the light of truth and righteousness that shines from the true Christian and in some cases reproves and opposes the darkness of this world that we encounter. We are to be lights by living open, honest, and exemplary lives in contrast to that darkness that we encounter. And so there are really good reasons why we're sent into the world. It's a sent into the world. It's a critical part of our development uh, and our demonstration that we are children of God. Okay, well, let's go on to part two of our discussion. You know, in what ways are we not of the world, even though we're fallen human beings? Well, as we read in, in the uh, uh, theme passage, um, he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. And so one of the ways in which we are not of the world is that we have a different father. We are begotten by God's Holy Spirit. We are new creatures. We are spiritual children of God. And, and this is expressed well, in 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2, how great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. 
The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now are we the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know, what a wonderful opportunity and privilege that is to be considered children by the Father, the creator of this universe. You know, Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it's a verse familiar to all of us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Be, behold, all things have become new. God has begotten in us this new mind, spiritually focused to develop the fruit we talked about earlier in our discussion. And I like the way Psalms talks about it in the 45th Psalm in verse 10 and 11. Because there we're sort of described uh, as a daughter. You know, the psalmist says, Listen, O daughter, give attention and incline your ear. Forget your people in your father's house. Then the king will desire your beauty. We've been called out of the house of Adam to be part of the house of God. Brother Tom? Yeah, and <clears throat> one of the... Uh passages uh, we, we, we notice was John the eighth chapter verses 42 to 45 and in this passage Jesus really bluntly draws a contrast between himself and we his followers and the world when he said if God were your father you would love me for I came from God and now am here I have not come on my own but he sent me why is my language not clear to you because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That is a real blunt contrast of our position where we should be and the world around us. Another way we're not of the world is as new creatures, our values, our treasures are to be different, spiritual. You know, Paul says this in Colossians, the third chapter, beginning with verse two, he says, set your mind on things above, not earthly things. And he was sort of expounding on something that Jesus said in Matthew, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 19. You know, Jesus said in a practical way how we execute on this. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. The treasures we put in heaven, no one can touch them. No one can take them away from us. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so that's really a key. That's where our heart needs to be, where our treasure is, and that needs to be in heaven. And so Jesus sort of concludes that, that statement with verse 33, Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You know, Paul adds this really kind of interesting statement, and it applies to all those who've given their heart to the Lord and have, have, have uh, made a consecration to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20 he says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in, which is in you, whom you have re or which you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. And how great was that price? The, plesh, the precious blood of Jesus. Therefore, Honor God with your body. Another illustration or, or way of expressing that we are not a part of this world is when, uh, when we recognize that our citizenship should not be counted in this world, but is counted in heaven. And Paul states that in Philippians 3.20, where he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Brother Ernie, on the way to convention driving the toll road, we, Jan and I saw a billboard that says, 
Christians and politics, question mark. What does Jesus say? That was all that was on the billboard. Well, we know what Jesus said in John 18, 36. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. And that's where our citizenship lies. You know, I like what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, the second chapter, in verses 19 through 22. He says, we're no longer strangers and aliens, but we are fellow citizens with the saints in our God's household. You know, verse 21, we're, being, we're growing into a holy temple in the Lord, who we're being built together into a dwelling of God by the Spirit. So we are God's household. Our citizenship is in heaven, and that is where we should be focused. Um, for the time, I think it's time that we move on to section number three. Okay. All right. So section number three is how do we stay separate from the world? How do we maintain this separation from the world? You know, there's this saying that the ship is in the sea, but the sea should not be in the ship. <laughs> so how do we stay separate from the world, Brother Ernie? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the verse that says, make straight paths for your feet. We find it in Hebrews 12, 13. And if you read it from Phillips, it goes, it's translated this way. Do not wander away from the path. That would be the path following in Jesus' footsteps. But forge steadily onward in the right path. The limping foot recovers strength and does not collapse. You know, and we need to think about this when we receive input from the outside, from our phones, from our computers, from our TVs, listening to any media, whether it comes to us in the radio or TV or streaming or it's on the internet, you know, is what we're paying attention to digitally and socially, is that making straight paths for our feet? You know, that's a question we need to be continually asking one another. You know, it, it brings to mind Psalms 2, verses 1 through 3. Why are the nations in an uproar, or King James says raging? You know, why are the peoples devising a vain thing? You know, the kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and his anointed, <clears throat> saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords away from us. You know, these devices, as well as computers and TVs and every part of the media sphere, they're part of this rage. They're part of this uproar that the psalm is speaking about. And they all, every channel, every network, every information provider across the entire political spectrum. You know, it's not just a right thing or a left thing. They all do this. They all seek to pull us into this rage. Why? Because it makes them money. And it increases their power and their influence. You know, and the more time we spend on these devices, the more time we listen to their messages, gives them just the greater opportunity, gives them the greater opportunity to get their hooks in us, to shape our perspective on the world, to shape our perspective on our fellow man, to basically engage us emotionally and keep pulling us back and pulling us back. And where are they drawing us? They're drawing us into the spirit of the world. <clears throat> You know, what are they doing? They are looking for recruits for the Lord's great army. <laughs> Do you want to belong to that organization? <clears throat> you can either be part of God's household or the Lord's great army, but you can't be both. So be careful and don't fall into that trap. They are looking for you and they want you to join them. We've already joined a different household. <laughs> And we can keep separate from the world by focusing our thinking on spiritual matters. We especially like Philippians 4.8 that says, Finally, brothers, 
whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. The things you were talking about are not included in that list. <clears throat> Uh, Colossians 3.16 also gives us thoughts along this line. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And that's one of the things we're doing gathered here in Johnstown. Absolutely. You know, Jesus exhorted us in John 15th chapter and verse four, we've already made a reference to this. He says, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. How does Christ abide in us? We must abide in Christ if we are to walk in the light, if we are to walk by the spirit, if we are to follow in our master's footsteps, you know, this reminds us of our convention theme hymn. What did Brother Rick say? Christ in you. That was really a description of the time period from our consecration to realizing our hope in the first resurrection. So if we walk in the light as children of light and not in the darkness, this can help us stay separate from the world. First uh, John 1, 5 to 7 was, was read as part of that presentation. And it says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Brother Comey elaborated on this in a very beautiful message. And then Paul adds in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses eight and nine, for you were formerly in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And that's speaking about putting that light in our life into action. <clears throat> this, this verse also is, is uh, helpful in defining what walking as children of the light really means, as we said. And we need to learn to walk in that light because we need to teach the world to walk in this light in the kingdom. You know, another way we keep separate from, the separate from the world is by walking or being led by God's Holy Spirit. You know, it reminds us of Galatians, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 16. Paul says, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And then verse 18, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And verse 25, for since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. Let the Spirit guide our steps. You know, in, in, in thinking about this, we um, found that Brother Russell has a lot of good advice about walking and being led by the Spirit in Volume 5. And here are a couple of short quotes that we thought we would leave for your consideration. Volume 5, page 244, paragraph 1. Quote, it rests with ourselves largely with our use of the means which God has provided, how fully we may be filled with his spirit and disposition, his influence. The spirit or the influence of his truth, which he has revealed for the very purpose of sanctifying our hearts and lives and separating us from those who have the spirit of the world. God's Holy Spirit is given to us to separate us from the world. And then the very next page, volume five, page 245, paragraph two, he says, it's in vain that we seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit if we do not give attention to the divine arrangement provided for this very purpose. If we neglect the word of God, we're neglecting the sanctifying power. 
If we neglect prayer, we are neglecting another privilege and the helpfulness which it brings. If we neglect assembling ourselves with those who are of the Lord's people and in whom we see the seal of his spirit being evidenced, we will fail to give to get the benefits and helps which every joint supplieth. And that's one of the benefits of, of, of gathering together in convention is getting the benefits of that which every joint supplieth. You know, Paul says in, in Hebrew, or excuse me, in Romans 8, chapter verses 13 and 14, he says, if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You know, we're all led by something. What are we being led? What spirit is leading us? Are we being filled and led by the spirit of God? If not, then we're, we're in danger of being led by the spirit of the world. Remember the world, the flesh, the devil, they're all trying to lead us in a different direction, any direction other than the narrow way. To what extent are we allowing them to lead us? What other things can we, can we do, Brother Tom, to stay separate? from the world. Well, one of the things that first came to my mind was placing the highest value on the right relationships. You know, we all have many friends in the world through work, school, our neighborhood, our community, but our dearest relationships should be with spiritually minded people. These should be the people who, uh, whose company we prefer above all others and who should be the most important influencers in our lives. Uh, Matthew 12 verses 48 to 50 says, but Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? For whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. And then the apostle Paul adds in Hebrews 10, 25, uh, the importance of keeping good company when he says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. And I like this very blunt statement from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. He says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It's a pretty sobering statement. Yes. Another action we can take to remain separate from the world is to be a doer of good in contrast to much of what we see going on in the world. You know, Paul has a lot of good advice about this. Uh, we're just going to mention some of these scriptures, Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how we may spur one another onto love and good deeds. It's not just our responsibility for ourselves, but we are to encourage one another to do good to be both an example and to encourage them to do it as well. Uh, Galatians 6, 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Do not give up doing good. And therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who are the family of believers. When we have an opportunity to do good, we have to seize it. Remember Mary, if she had waited for our Lord, she'd waited a few days later to anoint our Lord, he would have been gone. She seized the moment. Hebrews 13, 16, do not forget to do good and share with others with such sacrifices God is pleased. Sharing is a sacrifice that pleases God. Matthew 7, 12, our Lord said, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do unto you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Do good to others as you would have them do good to you. That's loving your neighbor as yourself. You know, you made, for the time you made a reference to the Good Samaritan parable earlier. And, and that makes the point that our neighbor can be anyone we see who has a need that we can fill. Don't pass up that opportunity. And finally, I like what, what James says in James 1.27. 
pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and our Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their distress, to help those who are less fortunate than we are, and to keep ourselves unstained from the world. Doing good is very important. So is cultivating humility. That helps us to stay separate from the world because it's so different from the spirit of the world. Uh, Proverbs 29, 23 says, a man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. That's the kind of honor we want to have from our heavenly father and our Lord Jesus. Philippians, the second chapter, verses three and four, um, reads this way. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast. Be humble toward one another, always considering others better than yourselves. And look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. You know, the world wants, wants to draw attention to themselves and look at me and gain notoriety. That should not be the pathway for the Christian. And that will keep us separate from that worldly spirit. And for, finally, on this point, 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6. This is a very important passage about humility. He writes, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. We all need the grace of God. And the gateway to receiving God's grace, Peter writes, is being humble. That's the gateway of grace, humility. Another way not to be swept up with the world and its thinking is to, is to avoid judgmentalism and the divisive, divisiveness and the, the tribalism that we see all across the world in various aspects of its society. Yeah, the spirit of the world today is deeply into these kinds of attitudes and practices. They are promoted, they're embraced through the media that you were talking about earlier. The true child of God loves the world as God, the true child loves the world as God loves the world, its peoples, but not its ways. And Matthew uh, 7 verses 1 and 2 tells us to not judge. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and the measure you use will be measured to you. And, and we're told that, that judgment is left with Jesus in Acts 17, 31. God has set a day when he will judge the world by justice, by the man he has appointed, and he has given proof of this to all men by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. And Paul makes a very important statement in 1 Corinthians 5.12, where he says it's not our business to judge those who are outside the church. That's what it says. What business is it of mine to judge those who are outside the church? Many Christian groups today, you hear them making all kinds of judgments about what's going on in the world around them. Paul says that is not our business. You know, rather than being judgmental, our mission is to bring, to promote peace both amongst ourselves and with others, and to tell them the peace of God that's coming their direction. You know, you know, Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And Paul tells us in a couple places, being a peacemaker is really, really, really important. Romans 12, 18, as far as it is possible, as far as it is depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. That, that's a pretty strong statement. And then he, he, asked, he adds in Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy without which no one will see the word. You know, and if we're going to live at peace with everyone, we cannot get caught up in this divisiveness, this tribalism, this judgmentalism, because we'll look down on others that are different. And 
We've already talked about how that is destructive to the Christian. Brother, and, Brother Tom, we're, we're kind of running out of time here, so if maybe we can give them some takeaways, you know, summary steps. Well, we're just going to say that it's very important in this particular year that we all know we're in oh, yeah. here in America to not get uh, carried away with the tribalism of partisan politics. We may all have opinions about these matters, but we should not care about them so deeply that we lose the peace that passes all understanding or that we forget that God has a plan that he is working out and his ways are higher than our ways. Even if we can't figure out what's happening, he's in control. And uh, so we, we want to remember to stay out of that. Thank you. Of, that was a very, 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 very important point to make. So not a, get cut off with the tenor of the times. Yes. Yes. Um, can I offer a couple of summary scriptures? Yes. Go ahead. So Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 13 to 16. Paul writes, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. <laughs> That's the contrast to divisiveness. Unity of faith among us and of the knowledge of the son of god to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of christ as a result we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried away by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men by craftiness and deceitful scheming but speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head even christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And this is really the goal, growing up into Christ. And this again fits right into the theme, Christ in you. This defines the holy conduct and godliness that we are to uh, aspire to and practice and is well stated in, in uh, 2 Peter 3.11, and this was related to the panel of the dialogue last night, 2 Peter 3.11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You ought to live holy and godly lives. You have a couple of closing scriptures? Well, we have, uh, we have a couple of passages uh... 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12, we counsel you to look, look that up in your own time because we're running out of time. But the one I would really like to read for you is in Colossians, the third chapter, beginning with verse 12. Paul says, so all those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, and then he tells us what we need to do. Put on a heart of compassion. That would be for all. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. We've been forgiven by God. It is our not only our duty, our privilege to forgive one another. And beyond all of these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfect unity. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, and be thankful. We're called to peace. We're called to be promoters of peace, peacemakers. And then he says in verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Coming back to the theme, Christ in you. Christ's words, his example, his life, his teachings is to live in us, to take control of our lives so that what people see in us is see Christ to the greatest extent possible. With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing in thankfulness in your hearts to God.